Welcome to Red Sky Alliance WAPAC Labs Monthly Threat Brief. My name is Bill Schenkelberg and I'll be your moderator today. We're starting back from our threat briefs after a summer break and we'll continue on a monthly basis here on in. Today we will be presenting three threat briefs which will last approximately 30 minutes. The first topic is why China's facial recognition technology is a problem. The second, a closer look at the lag time Chinese APT campaign. And the final, a short report on why we track vessel impersonations. Before we begin, and if you are viewing in live mode, the chat box to the right can be used to ask questions. Either Pamela or I will ask the question to the presenter at the end of the briefs. If viewing as in a recording, Questions can be, be delivered to feedback at wapaclabs.com. The email will come directly to myself and we'll get a timely answer to you as soon as possible. Our first presenter is a longtime Chinese subject matter expert. We call him Silkworm, which is his Red Sky Alliance code name. Silkworm has an extensive military and geopolitical background in Chinese intelligence collection and analysis. Today's brief will describe the worldwide use of facial recognition collection by the Chinese, which I think is a bit concerning to say the least. With that, I'll give the floor to Silkworm. Thank you, Bill. Good morning to everybody. Um, as you mentioned, I want to talk about uh, China and facial recognition. Um, facial recognition technology is not in and of itself a problem. I mean, I've got an iPhone in my pocket. It does a scan of my face in order to open up the phone. There's other apps on the phone that use facial recognition like to connect to my bank account from the phone. And so uh, that technology is developing into um, you know, a, a great service in, in its own way, a great convenience. Uh, China is developing it as we are in the West. But uh, I want to talk about some aspects of where they are going that should be of concern to us, in my opinion. Um, this kind of came to me as something that I think we need to talk about because the Chinese are now reaching a specific turning point in their development. And the, the icon for that turning point is the picture you see here. This pinwheel thing is actually a uh, brand new airline terminal. Next, please. This is the newest Beijing airport, Beijing Daxing. Daxing is a suburb on the south side of town. They're just opening this up. It was officially opened last month by Xi Jinping. And uh, it is, as it says here, this is the largest single building airport in the world. It's uh, state of the art from a Chinese perspective. And in some ways that means state of the art ahead of something that's available in the West. Um, it is now in operation. Some airlines have moved there. They expect a total of 50 airlines to be moving to this terminal as part of their operations. And it will eventually, at full capacity, be able to handle about 100 million passengers a year, about the same scale as Atlanta Airport. Um, OK, why is it a turning point? It is becoming a test ground for the implementation of a very extensive facial recognition system. There's in the process of installing up to 400 stations, like you see here, that are checkpoints uh, based on a facial scan that will allow a passenger to use all aspects of the terminal with showing no more ID than just their face. They can buy a ticket, they can check their luggage, they can check in, they can go through security, they can board the aircraft with the show of just their face, no other ID. Um, so this is a turning point to me in the fact that this is, this is a major implementation of facial recognition to an extent, at least in this test bed, beyond something that's going on in the West. Huawei is involved here, uh, with, uh, they're putting in their 5G network at the airport itself that, will, that enables the whole thing. China Eastern Airlines is the first airline to do the test. Uh, for their passengers, and China Unicom is the telecoms platform that uh, uses the 5G network. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and it's, it's, like I say, it's a data point, a turning point 
in the advancement of facial recognition in China. And I don't think technologically speaking, China is more advanced than uh, those who are developing facial recognition in the West, but it is being implemented at a practical level in several ways that have not yet been started in the West. Uh, what you see here is a couple examples of that. Here's a person clocking in at their work by scanning, by swiping their ID card, and then uh, having the facial scan to prove it's really them holding the ID card. So good system. The other one on the on the right is is a payment system that's uh, uh, using just your face to be scanned, connected to your ID, connected to your credit card that allows you to buy something at a vending machine. So that's one way that they're doing it. Next, please. Um, it's being implemented across several aspects of current Chinese society. That on the right is a, a guy going into the entrance of his high school in his school uniform, and uh, it's uh, scanning his face so they know who's attending. There's some tests being done at school where they've got cameras in the classroom to scan the faces to see if the students are paying attention or not. There's some tests being done to uh, make sure they can see who's going in and out of the school or where they are in the school. Are they where, are they where they're supposed to be? Are they in the classes that they're supposed to be in? These systems, these technologies are currently being tested. Uh, there's a couple of instances where they're putting it into housing complexes to scan you on the way in. They've had problems with people who are assigned to a housing complex, but are subletting it illegally. So they're checking to make sure the right faces are checking in at the, at the entrance to the housing complex. There are some places that are now using them in lieu of tickets. Uh, you use your face to buy access, and then your face is what gets you into the system. Uh, a couple of cities are doing things like encouraging seniors to get their face scanned, and they'll get free rides for a certain amount of time if they've done the scan and use their face as their ticket. And um, Alipay, which is China's biggest online payment system, similar to PayPal, belongs to the Alibaba group, uh, is putting like $5 billion over the next few years to develop a facial scan system for their online payment. So these are ways in which practical applications are being worked out in China. Um, and I would say a little bit ahead of us in a number of ways. And uh, these are the players from a, from a technology standpoint, from a production standpoint that are uh, taking a role in China. The software developers, these are the AI unicorns in China, that is startups that are valued at more than a billion dollars each. The valuation for these companies is what appears in the uh, parentheses there. And the point I guess I wanted to make is that this is artificial intelligence technology. Facial scan is an AI application. And China, through the Made in 2025 program, is as a nation putting investment money, development money into making China the AI leader in the world by 2025. That's their goal. This is one aspect of that. There's a number of Chinese companies involved. As you can see on the hardware side, Huawei is uh, very uh, heavily involved. Hikvision is actually the largest producer of the surveillance cameras that are being used in the network. So is this a problem? Well, it's a problem for China, depending on your attitude in that this technology is being applied at a national level very extensively with the intent of being able to track the entire population. They have just recently expanded the number of surveillance cameras in the country to 200 million cameras. And they are applying facial recognition AI software to be able to identify people on the street and track their movements. To what extent they're doing that right now, not really sure, but this is an apparent goal and they are working in that direction. And uh, their national level battle database is taking national level ID information about their individuals, like what you get off of a national ID card and matching that to faces so that they can know who is where in the country. You know, one of the initial Arguments for this is for law enforcement, and uh, they're applying this here. This is Meg V, one of the big makers, doing a demo 
can you scan somebody from the street, match them to a uh, criminal database, find somebody out in the world that you've been searching for? Uh, that has there've been some cases where they've uh, argued that that has worked. One case where somebody was wanted and they spotted him in a crowd of fifty thousand at a soccer match and uh, arrested him before he left the ground. So this is a justification for the system, but it's only one aspect of the system. This uh, is an expansion of control of the population that has been tightened up considerably since Xi Jinping came into power in 2013. Uh, it's being used for traffic control. It's uh, used to track track violators. Um, one of the cases is they've got a, a digital billboard at the side of a street, and if somebody jaywalks across the street, they scan their face, identify them from the national system, and then post their photo and what they did on the billboard right there at the crossing. So this is this is an attempt to shame the population into better behavior, but it's also got the potential to you know track misbehavior in a lot of ways. Uh, what you see on the left there is an advertisement of the police showing police with facial scanning uh, equipment in their phone, excuse me, in their glasses. So if they have a, somebody on the street that they think might be a suspect, they can scan them and figure out who they are. Uh, there's some talk of incorporating this into the developing social credit system that is being able to track misbehavior or good behavior by citizens at large and give them a social credit score. So if people are, say, for instance, uh, traffic violators or they're not going to the party meetings that they're supposed to go to, they would be not in jail, but they would be prevented from doing things like buy airline tickets. Um, don't know where this is going. That's the sort of thing that's being involved right now. But What's different in China from the United States is there is no real uh, argument at the popular level against the implementation of this kind of surveillance system. First of all, it's very difficult to be a dissident in China right now. But, you know, the debate that's going on in the United States about whether this, whether states or police uh, departments or should be allowed to use facial recognition because it might be too... Uh, intrusive into person's privacy. That debate is not going on in China. And uh, probably the, the best reflection of where China could be going with this is how this is being applied in the northwest of China, the home of the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs are a separate ethnic group. They are a Central Asian ethnic group, uh, distinct from Han Chinese, and they are also distinct because they are Muslim. There's about 11 million of them. They live in Xinjiang province in the northwest. And uh, skipping the facial recognition part, the Chinese government is working very hard to get these people under control, fearing that there's a Mus Muslim dissident population in their midst. And uh, draconian measures they're putting into place are uh, causing a lot of concern out in the world. Of the 11 million population of Uyghurs, about a million right now are in what sometimes called concentration camps. They are in re-education camps. They're trying to train them out of their Uyghur religious identity, train them out of a separate uh, ethnic identity, and have them embrace a Chinese identity. But it's through a very heavy-handed system of control. And facial recognition is becoming part of this. So that... Uh, what the police are trying to do, what they even say they are doing, is creating a database of all Uyghur faces. And they part of the software being applied, the AI being applied, is to be able to distinguish the facial features of a Uyghur, ethnic Uyghur, from those of a Han Chinese, so that they're tracking the Uyghur population and not worrying about the Chinese population. And so there, you've got a number of play ways that they're doing that, either on the street or in the case of the photo you've seen here. This is a facial scanner that's been set up at a mosque, so that if you go into the mosque, you've got to have your face scanned first so they know who's been there. And our friend Huawei is deep into this project. Uh, this is the text here is advertising from the Huawei website. 
that uh, they are working with the police in Xinjiang. They're doing development up there for facial recognition and monitoring, uh, policing, and that they've established a lab there for facial recognition development and better surveillance technology. So Huawei, we think of Huawei as a potential problem in our country. Huawei is taking this role in their own country. And Huawei is, in fact, as we've talked about before, not just uh, deploying surveillance systems and cameras and uh, monitoring infrastructure, but they're doing it across the world. They are, already have contracts in more than 40 countries across the world. Again, this is advertising from their own web place. So their smart city solution inv involves a very extensive surveillance camera-based, AI-based AI uh, tracking system. Uh, to for police and city management to use. And so their networks are already out in the world doing the same functions uh, that they are advertising that they're doing in Xinjiang problem. So it's not just a problem for China. It's a problem for other countries in that if you have Huawei deployed surveillance networks in other countries, Chinese law says that Chinese companies have to cooperate with intelligence agencies if requested. So that means, at least in theory, that the Huawei networks, if Chinese intelligence systems uh, services wanted to have access to Huawei surveillance networks out in other countries, Huawei would be obliged to cooperate. So what does that mean to us? Well, we don't have Huawei deployed networks in the United States. We've been very pointed about trying to keep Huawei technology out of the United States. So that situation doesn't really apply to us. But there are other ways in which uh, facial recognition by China can be used against the United States and other countries. And one aspect of this, one, one uh, example, is software called TikTok. TikTok I didn't know a lot about till I dug in here because I'm an old man. I'm not a teenager. Uh, this is very popular software that's uh, uh, in most countries around the world. It's basically uh, creating your own uh, short videos from your own your own video scans or doing uh, lip syncing to uh, music videos, something like that. The demographic is largely 16 to 24 year olds, and it's super popular across the planet. It was. Uh, it's been downloaded more than a billion times. There's something like 700 million monthly active users of TikTok around the planet, and that includes at least 27, 26 million active users in the United States. So this is this is teenage entertainment software, teenage entertainment app. Next, please. The problem is it's Chinese software. Zhang, Zhang Yiming, who is right here, is the developer here. And his company is not a music video company. It's an AI development company. He developed the software inside China in 2016, a version called Douyin. TikTok is theoretically a completely separate version of this, which is kept on separate servers. So that you've got China-only content in Douyin and foreign-only content in TikTok. And... Um, don't know how big the firewall is between those two, but ByteDance, which is his company, extremely popular. It's currently valued at $75 billion. Zhang Yimin, who started the company only in 2012, is personally worth now $16 billion. So these apps have made this guy fantastically wealthy. Why do we care about that? Well, again, here's TikTok's terms of service as published. And this is probably not a lot different from Facebook's term of service, if you want to look at it that way. I consider this very concerning. They say, we're collecting this information about you. And, uh, you know, if you, if you scan through here, you see, you know, how do you log into social media? What is your credit card information? We, we uh, collect your photographs and all your visual content. We collect the content from all of your messages that you post. We collect your contact list, your IP address, your GPS location, your browser history. This is a lot of data that is available to TikTok. This is what they say they collect. And uh, from my perspective, the problem is that TikTok isn't about that data. It's about faces. The whole, the whole point is the user standing up and 
doing a little dance or something in front of the, his own camera, putting his face out there. And because China's spatial recognition uh, technology is all about taking a face and matching it with other identity data, this provides an ability of the Chinese to track uh, the data associated with users across the world that are using TikTok. And TikTok, uh, Zhang Yiming has been very pointed about how much he plans to cooperate with the government, that he's putting more monitors on his system to, to make sure that there's no inappropriate content out there. He pledged to hire 10,000 individuals to monitor and give priority to hiring 10,000 of uh, these people to monitor his app to Communist Party members. That was a specific pledge that he made. So the combination of all this, to me, gives the Chinese government at least theoretical access, not only to the personal data of 100 million, hundreds of million people across the globe, but also to matching that data with faces in order to provide a theoretical way to track individuals, and that includes tens of millions of people in the United States. One final point about TikTok. Um, again, the Douyin system inside the China inside China is heavily monitored, heavily filtered, because that's the case for almost any kind of social media inside China. TikTok operates only outside the United States, so theoretically, it is not monitored by the same system. However, it apparently is. That is, last month, the Washington Post published their data analysis looking at how TikTok handles the Hong Kong protests, where people for the last several months have been protesting, advocating for democracy in Hong Kong. And so on Twitter and Instagram, hashtags relative to the Hong Kong protests turn out tens of thousands of postings, articles, pictures having to do with the protests. Washington Post went through with the same hashtags on TikTok and found almost no discussion about the Hong Kong protests, almost no photos or videos about the Hong Kong protests. And since the interest is the same across the planet as indicated by Twitter and Instagram, that means somebody is filtering TikTok. That ByteDance on behalf of the government is censoring TikTok as it is operated in other countries, including the United States. So it's only showing news that is appropriate from a Chinese government standpoint. So bottom line to me is facial recognition is a problem. It's a problem for China because it's becoming the basis for a massive surveillance state. It's a problem for other countries because through Huawei and other companies, the surveillance networks are being expanded into tens of countries across the planet, and that for, through access to other software that is face-based, like TikTok, it is capable of doing data collection inside the United States. And if they're filtering for content, that means as a social medium that China is already using this medium as a, a way of influencing opinion in other countries, including in the United States. Any questions I can answer on this? One comment is, wow, <clears throat> 1984 is here, huh? <laughs> For China, it is. And Xi Jinping has greatly increased the capability of the government to do these things. I you mean, always... it's, it's, it's as a, of a piece with all the rest of the things he's doing where uh, you know, he's arresting human rights lawyers. He's filtering all social media. He's uh, he's introducing a much more importance to uh, adherence to communist ideology across the country. And technologically speaking, he's using the technologies that China's development to make this kind of surveillance state possible. Be between you and I, we've we've more you than than I. Uh, we've re been reporting on Huawei extensively, and uh, in the past, I think year or two years since the Trump administration, there's been a ban on Huawei, you know, products and services in the United States. Uh, recently, the, I, I heard and read that that there were softening up on on that um, on the connection with Huawei. Uh, do you see any? challenges with that or, or I, concerns? Well, I mean, if, it, if we 
walk back from the current stance to the point where Huawei is being allowed to uh, lay down infrastructure, network infrastructure in the United States, that would be a problem from my perspective. And again, you know, Huawei is not an agent of the government, but it is not in a position to refuse to cooperate with the government if it's got networks that the government want to look at, whether that's in China or anywhere else in the world, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. One last, in your research, your recent research, how accurate do you think this uh, facial recognition is? Have, have um, you come across that? I think, uh, I think that's why I think the D D Dashing Airport is an important data point, because at a commercial level, they're saying, you want to want to use our airport and fly on our airline? As long as we've got a scan of your face, you can use that every at every step in the process, including the security screening, including boarding the aircraft. So they trust it to the point of uh, doing that for a close-up scan. Now, whether the surveillance camera scan on the street uh, can do it to the same granularity, that's a question. But what's going on in China also is the development and the fielding of much higher resolution surveillance cameras. So wow. that uh, the what what used to be you know what you see in you know NCIS or cop shows with that kind of grainy look down the alley this person might be going in the back door to uh, a granularity that would allow them to do facial scans for identification. Well, great! Thank you for your presentation. As always, you you hey, do hey, a Bill? fantastic job. Bill, we've got a question here from Jonathan. He's asking, Silkworm, do you see any American companies involved with this? Uh, no, I do not. Uh, I've not. At least the systems that are going in inside China and the facial recognition development, it appears to be, you know, China domestic uh, are the ones who are involved and their their level of technological development is at least as good as what's going on in the West. So they don't have to depend on Western companies to get there. Okay. Well, thanks again for your uh, somewhat scary presentation here this that's morning. My, that's my mission to scare you. <laughs> well, thank you. Our next speaker is Ari Hackinson. Ari, Ari was awarded a bachelor's degree in linguistics and computer science from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Ari has been a cyber analyst for WAPAC Labs and Red Sky Alliance for the past four years. She specializes in technical analysis and is currently supporting many clients and with their uh, cyber intelligence reporting. She's currently working on our Team Jaeger, which is German for hunter team, which is our threat analysis hunt team, and she is focusing on the energy sector. Her brief today details a new web malware named Operation Lagtime IT which is targeting government agencies in East Asia with malicious emails that deliver new custom malware. The campaign is being carried out by Chinese APT threat actors and is sophisticated, highly targeted, and may be related to other campaigns and threat actor groups. With that, I'll pass the floor to Ari. Thank you, Bill. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Bill said, my name is Oriana Hackinson. I'm a cyber analyst. Today, I'm going to be talking about the lag time Chinese APT campaign. I'll start off with some background, and then I will uh, talk about some of the delivery mechanisms, the details, technical details on the malware, um, and the infrastructure. So uh, beginning in March of 2019, analysts at Proofpoint began tracking a new APT campaign that was observed leveraging multi-stage malware payloads. These were delivered via spear phishing emails containing malicious RTF document attachments. The campaign has been active as recently as July of 2019, and the campaign is targeting various government agencies in East Asia, including agencies overseeing information technology, domestic affairs, foreign affairs, economic development, and political processes. So Proofpoint has attributed this campaign to a Chinese APT group tracked as TA428. The campaign leverages similar TTPs to past Chinese APT campaigns, including the Maudu surveillance operation, and makes use of both commodity and custom malware. The custom malware in this campaign is a new remote access Trojan that was dubbed COTX. Follow-on analysis by WAPAC Labs revealed that the second stage payload contained hard-coded internal IP addresses 
suggesting deliberate targeting and the ability of the malware to access internal networks. Static artifacts found in the malware specimens uncovered a number of additional indicators, including dropper and payload samples and C2s. So the Lagtime APT campaign delivered malware via spear phishing emails containing malicious RTF document attachments. You can see a one, uh, an example of one of those RTF documents on the right-hand side of the slide. It is in Mongolian. It is talking about some information technology-related topics. The spear phishing emails were sent from both free email accounts through yahoo.co.jp or yahoo.com, or they were also sent from compromised user accounts within the targeted organizations. The emails contain the RTF decoy documents with social engineering in the document or the email contents referencing topics related to information technology. For example, the attackers used the subject line ITU Asia Pacific online COE training course on conformity and interoperability in 5G for the Asia Pacific region as a lure to encourage victims to open the attachment. Earlier samples of these RTF documents submitted back in April of 2019 reference similar IT related topics, but use the Mongolian language rather than English. So that's the example that you see on the right. And this suggests that there may have been earlier versions of the campaign with similar TTPs, but slightly different social engineering and targeting. The RTF documents attempt to exploit CDE 2018-0798, which is a vulnerability in Microsoft Equation Editor. The exploit code drops to the temp directory and executes an executable file named 8.t, which is embedded in the RTF document as an OLE attachment. Upon execution, the 8.t dropper writes a .wll file to the Windows startup directory. And this file dropper mechanism and RTF weaponization has been attributed in the past to Chinese APT groups, including Goblin Panda, APT40, Ice Fog. And this suggests that a, this campaign is being also targeted or carried out by Chinese threat actors. So the file that is dropped during CVE 2018-0798 exploitation contains the COTX RAT code. Upon execution, the COTX RAT establishes persistence with the creation of a run key. It also contains a check remote debugger present function and exits if a debugger is found. The configurations for the COTX RAT are found in a PE section named .COTX, which is where the name of the RAT comes from. And these configurations are AES192 encrypted and also Base64 encoded. So you can see an example of uh, one of the encrypted configurations in the image on the slide. The decoded configurations contain the C2 hosts and ports, a mark field, and a password field. Cotex then injects the second stage malware into existing processes. The second stage payload communicates with the C2 that is found in the Cotex configurations. And all of the samples used the same C2 IP address, which is hosting the domain mtanews.vzglagtime.net. It also uses Wolf SSL for TLS encrypted communication. Some of these spear phishing emails in this campaign were also seen delivering poison IV payloads to the same targets. These payloads were delivered in the same manner as the Cotex payloads via a RTF document attachment that once opened exploits CVE 2018-0798 and drops the executable file. Shared C2 infrastructure between the Poison IV and Cotex payloads suggests that they are part of the same campaign. The use of Poison IV as a final payload also suggests that this may be a Chinese APT campaign. The Poison IV rat is a popular malware family amongst Chinese threat actors. A similar Maudi surveillance campaign, for example, that was attributed, attributed to Chinese threat actors also used the poison ivy malware and also went after Mongolian targets. So the campaign was named Lagtime after the domain vzglagtime.net. There are four subdomains of this domain. Three of them resolve to C2 IPs used by the Cotex and poison ivy rats. The fourth one, which is rtc.vzglagtime.net resolves to a different IP which does not have any malware associations on virus total, but is associated with some malicious URLs. This domain and IP address might also have been used as C2s in this campaign. All of the domains were registered by godaddy.com on August 29th of 2018. Both of the C2 IP addresses were located in the Netherlands and belong to the autonomous system AS20473 Chupa LLC. The second stage payloads used by the Codex rat samples in this campaign were seen communicating with IPs that are internal addresses. 
These IP addresses are observable as ASCII strings in the payload files. This indicates that the spear phishing campaign is being targeted to specific targeted victims and that this final second stage payload is intended to run once the actor attacker already has access to the victim's internal network. So in conclusion, uh, the attacker TTPs, including the use of custom context wrap malware, complex delivery mechanisms, multi-stage payloads, and spear phishing emails, suggest that the lag time campaign is sophisticated and highly targeted and may be related to other campaigns and threat actor groups. The configurability of the Cotex RAT, as well as its multi-stage delivery mechanism and anti-debugging features, make it likely to be used in future campaigns. Um, although the motive for this campaign is not known for certain, the targeting of government agencies and the use of RAT malware indicates that this may be a state-sponsored surveillance or reconnaissance campaign. A full list of indicators is available in the Threat Recon API, and there are YARA role mitigations for the Cotex RAT, the dropper malware, and the second stage payload in the full report. And that is all I had on the lag time campaign. Were there any questions? Pamela, any questions? I can't see the chat section. <laughs> uh, no problem. No, there is no questions yet. Anybody got anything for Ori? Yeah, this is, this is John. I'm just checking the indication that it's China is primarily because of the use of poison ivy as as used by China in the, in in other cases. Um, yeah, it was kind of a number of TTPs, including the use of the um, the poison ivy, also the dropper, uh, the file dropper mechanism, and the RTF weaponization. Um, the technical details on that were similar to past Chinese APT campaigns, and also just the targeting um, and. Uh, Social engineering in the uh, malicious emails was consistent with a, a Chinese attribution. Okay, good. That sounds pretty conclusive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Corey, I got another question for you from uh, sure. Dan. He's saying, where are the hosting ASNs located? Uh, Netherlands. It was uh, Chupa LLC in the Netherlands. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I will pass it back over to Bill. Thank you, Ari. As always, you did an excellent job. It is very informative. Our final brief will be from Austin Talbot. Austin was first introduced via our internship program. And because he did such a great job, we hired him. And he began his cybersecurity career in 2018 after graduating from Southern New Hampshire University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in information technology. From June of 18 to present, Austin has operated as a cybersecurity analyst and a SOC analyst at WAPAC Labs, focusing on identifying vulnerabilities and other cyber threats. His brief today keys in on the importance of tracking vessel impersonation. Our active vessel, motor vessel, or motor tanker keyword usage collection and analysis provide common lore techni techniques that and tactics that are employed to entice users in the maritime industry to open emails containing malicious attachments. With that, Austin, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. As Bill said, uh, my name is Austin Talbot, and I'm a cyber analyst with WAPAC Labs. And for today's brief, I want to take some time to talk to you about how malicious actors can impersonate motor vessels and motor tankers in malicious emails and then subsequently target companies, vendors, and port authorities operating under the maritime shipping and transportation industries. And this is just one of the many cyber threats the maritime and shipping industries face on a daily basis. So some of the things I'll discuss today include how simple it is for malicious actors to find vessel information online, uh, why vessel impersonation is used to target maritime companies and vessels. Uh, we'll take a look at some specific use cases. And I'll talk a bit about why WAPAC Labs continues to track these vessel impersonations. So believe it or not, there are actually a lot of open source sites where shipping vessel information is available for anyone to view, uh, even hackers. A lot of, or a couple of these sites are marine traffic and .com and vesselfinder.com. And these sites contain databases of shipping vessel names, uh, what company or country the vessel is affiliated with, voyage schedules for these vessels and uh, these sites even provide a live map of where specific vessels are currently located uh, geographically. So here on this slide, we have a satellite produced map, which was pulled directly from marinetraffic.com. And it shows uh, directly where certain vessels are located in international waters currently. Uh, this is a live map that's uh, produced by the site. 
hackers can use this real-time map to target any of these vessels or, or ports that they're docking in with uh, emails containing malware. And you can and you can see just how many vessels are being tracked by these sites daily on the map here. It's actually a really powerful tool that people may not realize can be used for nefarious purposes. And also provided by sites like marinetrafficdark.com are lists of vessels, uh, the countries that they're operating under, and their estimated times of arrival at certain ports and what's and what uh, when they're scheduled to dock. And again, sites like these are just really valuable resources for hackers who are tracking and targeting various ports or crew members of vessels because of a lot of the information they're looking for is just there for anyone to see, really. So in order to impersonate specific vessels, attackers can send an email with a malicious attachment with the subject line motor vessel, abbreviated to MV, or motor tanker, abbreviated to MT, alongside the vessel name that they want to appear to be associated with. And on the slide here are some examples of the subject lines that WAPAC Labs has observed being used in malicious emails targeting shipping companies all over the world in recent weeks. One thing to note is that a lot of times the malicious sender will use all caps or words like urgent to further catch the attention of the recipient to further entice them or, or persuade them into opening emails uh, with these malicious attachments. So on the slide here is just one example of a full malicious email sent from a malicious uh, cyber criminal. Notice the subject line used in an attempt to impersonate the motor tanker uh, Ocean Star. A lot of the vessel themed emails we observe in our collections request quotations for vessel repair costs like the email you can see here. And also notice that there's uh, quite a few spelling mistakes seen throughout adding to the uh, emails illegitimacy as well as the fact that there's no professional footer provided in this email. And if the email were legitimate, a footer or signature that looked at least somewhat professional uh, would most likely be present. So the supply chain is increasingly becoming a major target of cyber attacks as hackers realize how vulnerable certain uh, smaller vendors can be. With a lot of moving parts and vessels transporting many products, the maritime industry itself has become a major target uh, because and also the human factor of these companies is now uh, the most vulnerable piece. And cyber criminals realize this fact and are now attempting to exploit the human factors of companies as much as they can, because these cyber criminals, they do realize that these attack these they realize that these types of attacks can be successful as uh, human error is a security gap. Uh, companies are increasingly trying to close, but it is one of the most difficult security gaps to close, and it can be a time-consuming issue for these companies as well. Uh, increasing user security awareness across an entire organization can't happen overnight, and it's really not an easy problem to correct. Unfortunately, targeted cyber attacks that cripple organizations have become more and more common in the industry. For example, the Norwegian aluminum and renewable energy company Norse Hydro fell victim to a uh, Locker Gaga ransomware attack earlier this year. And this attack cost the company nearly $52 million in just the company's first quarter. So not only are these attacks on the maritime and shipping industry numerous, they're also extremely costly. So we've been tracking vessel impersonation emails using our Cyber Threat Analysis Center, or CTAC, for a while now. And we produce weekly reports on exactly which vessels are being used as lures in these malicious emails. On the slide here are vessel theme keywords that we query each week. And we track not only the vessels that are being impersonated, but also the sending and receiving IP addresses of these emails. And doing this provides us with a greater sense of where the threats are coming from and which companies or entities are being targeted. And this also indicates which areas of the supply chain are more vulnerable. And we keep an eye out to see whether or not the recipient of an email address, or, sorry, the recipient of an, a malicious email uh, start to appear in our collections as the sender of a malicious email, which could indicate that there was a possible malware infection that has taken place. And, you know, that's something that we try to watch out for as much as possible. And we would then share that observed intelligence with the affected parties through our watch lists and uh, additional reporting. So monitoring vessel impersonation emails allows us to identify trends and malware efficient campaigns targeting shipping companies and allows us to help protect container shipments, tanker products, and bulk commodities. And identifying the vessels chosen for impersonation helps us to provide situational awareness to professionals 
within the transportation and energy sectors. This type of specialized reporting also aids us in identifying potential weaknesses uh, in the supply chain. And that's all I have for the, today's briefing. I want to thank you all for attending. And is there any questions? Emily, any questions? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Well, I, I know uh, I help Austin with uh, the vessel impersonation and helping the maritime industry with close to 90% of worldwide commodities being shipped via um, ocean going vessels and, and all vessels because it's the cheapest way to ship. Uh, the vulnerability is huge, and we're finding that the maritime industry is actually a couple steps behind um, the rest of the world and their technology, and they're, and they're falling prey to some of these uh, attacks uh, through malware, through phishing campaigns and everything. That's the reason why we started doing these collections for some of our clients and for, for anyone that's interested. Uh, we post these products in our portal, which is Red Sky Alliance, all one word, redskyalliance.org. That and our uh, maritime watch lists are also posted in there. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, please visit that our portal. And without further ado, uh, I want to thank everyone for attending our October threat brief. Our next threat brief is scheduled for... November 14th at 12 o'clock noon Eastern Standard Time, same time as, as we did it today. And if anyone's listening to this broadcast on a recorded, in the recorded mode, you and if you have any questions, please contact us via feedback at wapaclabs.com. Hey, Bill. All right. I, I've held this for the end because I didn't want to interrupt anybody, but uh, um, the TikTok is 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 a big deal, and Senator Tom Cotton from uh, Arkansas has uh, contacted wanting an investigation from the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, this was as of yesterday because there's a threat of over 110 million downloads in the USA alone, and so you know what we're reporting here uh, has national you know significance. And if any of you, you know, want to take a look at the uh, the letter or the investigation, you can go to uh, Tom Cotton, Arkansas senator, and you can see the letter and what they want done. Because this is this just because it's a kids game doesn't mean that this is not uh, not intelligence gathering on as many Americans as, as possible. So, thank you for letting me jump in here. So, back to you. Okay, thanks, Jim. And with that, I will wish everyone a, a good day. Thank you.